Liberating yourself from unconscious shadow projections is one of the most critical psychological quests that you could ever undertake. But unfortunately, it's an impossible quest. Shadow projections can never be fully withdrawn because the depth and breadth of your unconscious mind and unconscious body are simply beyond comprehension, which is why we call it the unconscious, and this gets even more complex. If you have a history of trauma, idealization, romanticization, paranoia, or hypervigilance, which is anyone who's clicked on this video, myself included, ultimately, in a single sentence, managing shadow projections is a life-long process with no discernible outcome or endpoint. I'll say that again. You're never going to finish. You will never have fully integrated your shadow. You will never truly know if you're projecting or seeing reality clearly. But there are a few strategies and tactics that I see work in one-to-one -one space and also in my own life, which I'd love to introduce you to, so you can move yourself along that spectrum of clarity and aim towards something like a clear view of the world. That's what we're going to explore in this video, which is my direct response to this question from Mandy. Mandy asked me in the comments section of a previous video, get involved if you want. She says, as I'm working on myself and trying to figure out my own projections and my own trauma within my relationships and in the real world, whilst being confronted by other projections and traumas, how does one differentiate from one's own traumas and projections in these moments? And then she goes on a little bit further to talk about a specific example with someone's potential shadow or her potential trauma and that general feeling of uncertainty about how to distinguish between the two. Mandy, thank you for the question. I'd like to respond with an ultimate, hopefully comforting, if not slightly frustrating response. Again, you can't truly know. Healing operates on a spectrum. Consciousness exists on a spectrum and the shadow itself is a territory not an entity. This is a phrase that came to me in full force a few weeks ago as I was preparing to film a six-week, six-part shadow work lecture series, which may be out now if you're watching this in the future, where I'm going to go into every element of the shadow to the most depth that I possibly can to try and make it something which is practically feasible for someone like Mandy who's asking these questions about how do I know if it's my trauma? How do I know if I'm projecting? How do I know if I'm actually perceiving correctly? It's a really sticky territory. I want to give you a metaphor. Again, shadow being the territory and not an entity. Unfortunately, I've got these wonderful little visual aids. I want you to imagine that this light is the unhealed state. And then when you've healed, you've got some more vision. You've got a bit more clarity to shine into the darkness. And the darkness in this case is the shadow territory. This is the unconscious. This is the yet to be integrated material of whatever archetype, whatever part, whatever complex you're still working through. You shine that light into the darkness and you can see, oh, that's the outline of that shadow figure within the shadow territory. And then progressively, as you do more healing, you get a stronger light. And then you keep going for a few more years and look at you, you are shining deep into the shadow realm and now you can see all of your unconscious as it actually is. No, that's not the truth. As the light increases, so does the shadow. In the same way that the spotlight on a lighthouse peak will shine into the darkness, it might have a very long, very clear beam of illumination. But from illuminating, you then see just how much darkness is left. You can never truly see where your trauma ends and where someone else's reality begins. And that's a very Zen Buddhist way of approaching life. There's a classic Buddhist analogy, not only the lighthouse shining into the dark and the territory, not the entity, but there's a classic Zen Buddhist meditation phrase where if you imagine yourself in front of a house and I would say to you, well, what do you see there? And you say, I see a house. And I were to describe the house as four walls and two floors and this many windows and this colored door, I might say, well, yeah, that's true. I am seeing a house. But if I was truly honest with my perception, 
all I'm actually seeing is a two-dimensional image which represents the front of the house and I might be projecting or assuming or expecting that the rest of the house is there. Not to get into schizophrenic territory where we believe that the world is merely a matrix-like projection of some kind of technological demonic force, although some people do believe that, I don't personally think it holds much value. You can only ever see the face value of what you're presented with, so the way that shadow projection works, again projecting the territory of the unconscious to wrap around the image, is something like a filling in the gaps mechanism. And if you're in an intimate relationship with somebody who you trust, and let's imagine it's a romantic partner, somebody who you trust, somebody that you have history with, you've got enough confirmed reality to fill in the gaps around that two-dimensional image that they present to you. You know their history, you know their dreams, you know their rough way of being in the world, but upon occasion, you might need to fill in the gap when they say something which is ambiguous. And this is where a projection launches out. The projection happens unconsciously and automatically because there is simply too much variance and too much possibility in the world around us. What I mean by this is that you need to do quick thinking very often. In a romantic situation with your partner, it might be many months or many years where you've got to know someone. This is a different situation from the person on the street who walks past you and you can't instinctively tell who they are. You can instinctively tell what they look like and maybe if they're safe or what their vibe might be like, but you can't tell who they are. You have to fill in the gaps if they're a particularly attractive romantic stranger and they're your type, whatever that might be, you might latch on a certain idealization projection. If they're a particularly disgusting person, if you have a particularly homophobic, racist or otherwise undesirable projection mindset when it comes to a certain type of person, you might instantly label that person with all those negative traits that of course exist in your shadow territory. The territory perhaps of you being someone who really values logical thinking and you see someone who's wearing a certain garment, let's say, I don't know, a really colourful corset. You know, it must be in a strange street, maybe you're in a really alternative city somewhere, but someone comes past you in a really colourful corset and you're in your nice tidy grey suit, you might look at them and go, wow, that's like one of those hippies, one of those stupid creative types, and yeah, the obvious cliche is, well, you're hiding from your own creativity, and therefore you're projecting that outwards, and you're hating on that which you're not, and it's not a very interesting conversation, it's so obvious, but it's worth restating, because that's the fundamental dynamics of shadow projection. We're projecting that which is yet to be integrated inside of us, but this doesn't mean that we're fully seeing who they are, or that we're fully covering up who they are. Usually, for a projection to take hold, the person must have at least some degree of receptivity to the shadow hook that we launch at them. It's almost like they've got the little hooks for us to latch onto. So the creative woman who's going down the street, see even there, I call her a creative woman. The woman who's walking down the street in the colourful corset, she's pretty likely to be a creative, eccentric kind of character. It's unlikely that she works in administration at a banking firm. She's probably quite alternative, and she dresses herself in a way that projects that out into the world as her persona identity, and then will project onto her to meet her projection somewhere in that grey middle ground where truth becomes subjective. When it comes to Mandy's question in regards to trauma and how these dynamics work in charge space, we get into a more difficult conversation. In a situation like, let's say, abuse, Let's say there's an abusive dynamic, we'll stay with verbal abuse for now. Let's say there's a moment of disagreement that escalates into a verbally abusive situation between two people. What's often happening in this situation is that they're both seeing each other as they actually are, but they're, uh, they're both also projecting onto each other who they're actually not. Usually it's a father figure, a mother figure, a former lover, and maybe some kind of archetypal ideal of the heroic masculine or sexy dark masculine or the heroic feminine and the seductress feminine or whatever archetype they are particularly drawn towards. Someone could say, for example, the male partner could say, I don't feel like you ever 
listen to me or you're ever listening to what I'm saying, and the female partner could say, well, that's really rich for you to say, you never give me any attention and you're always on your phone and they're bickering backwards and forwards and it's like, where are we going with this? What's important to focus on is, as an individual, how does your nervous system respond? Don't worry about the conversation itself. If you're trying to do this work over many years, what remains within your control, the core power that you have in regards to withdrawing your shadow projections, is noting the intensity within. The greatest indication to a shadow projection being launched and you not seeing that person for who they actually are, but merely overlaying an unresolved trauma unfairly onto them and who they are or appear to be in this moment, is the intensity that you feel in relation to maybe a minor indiscretion. If your partner looks away from you for a second and picks up their phone and checks the time, and you experience that as the equivalent of having been run away from, or having been sworn at in the face, or maybe physically struck, it's unlikely that that's what they were doing in that moment. It's very likely that you're projecting something unresolved onto them in an unfair way, and then of course you'll wrap them into that shadow dynamic if you're unconscious, and then you might actually bring that out of them. This is where it gets complex. Someone who has that unresolved trauma, let's say an abandonment wound, but I think that's the example that seems to be coming through. There's an abandonment wound where you want your partner to be present with you. They indicate in a moment of lacking presence, you're talking and they just go like, oh, yeah, yeah, no. and in that split second, when they look at their phone, you feel the weight of all of those wounds past, all of those years, all of those experiences where other people have done something like that, but on a much greater level of intensity, and your internal intensity is matched disproportionately. You're hypervigilantly triggered by what's a very small gesture of looking at a phone, and then the tragedy of many shadow dynamics in relationships is that one partner will then see that, and they'll respond like that, and then fate becomes prescribed, basically. You'll respond with a sharp remark, and you'll go, you're always looking at that phone, and then I go, no, I'm not. And then maybe an insult will come out, or maybe some other repressed, resented memory will come out. And lo and behold, within two minutes, they are indeed that person who's leaving out the door and abandoning you. Was that them, or was that you? How can you claim responsibility for your part to play in that particular shadow interaction where you thought you were seeing them clearly, and you did, you did literally see that they picked up their phone and they ignored you for that split second. But how, you, how do you discern that moment where it becomes clearly an unrealistic, delusional overlay which isn't to do with them, and yet it could be to do with them because just two minutes later they confirmed that they were indeed that abandoning kind of person? I can't give you the answer. The truth is that the shadow projection process and the shadow withdrawal process is always a process that is managed consistently with every one-to-one -one and one-to-many situation that we find ourselves in. There's no definable, discernible rule book for seeing reality. We are locked in subjective perceptual space. This is one of the great um, conclusions of Immanuel Kant, if I'm re recovering it collectively on like the, the pure reason that you can't see reality as it actually is. We're always distorted to one degree or another. And if we're wearing the trauma goggles, of course, we're particularly distorted. And no matter how many healing lights we may shine into the darkness, no matter, no matter how many moments of illumination we bring forwards, there's always going to be more to see. There's always going to be more shadow. There's always going to be more trauma. There's always going to be more uncertainty. And really the only tool that I can possibly give you is the faith and the perspective and the mindset of discernment and a healthy detachment from your own perceptions. We go back to the example of the Buddhist monk sitting in front of the house who says, yes, it appears that it may be a house, but it could just be a two-dimensional image with like a wooden propping at the back because I haven't seen all four sides of the building. I may imagine that there is a family of four inside. I may imagine that there's a dog and a cat, but that's someone projecting through fantasy. And you can extrapolate that whole vision outwards into any 
day-to-day -day interaction that you may have. Truly the way to be sane and the way to be grounded in what is fundamentally a very insane and very destabilizing experience of being a human is that my camera is now overheating. The point is to embrace ambiguity and understand that being an adult in a complex world means that things will be uncertain and often very frustrating because we're never really going to get to the truth of somebody else's internal reality. We can only ever go off their actions, but their actions also can't be perceived clearly if we've got a background of trauma. The responsibility that you and I have is to do our trauma work and heal our nervous system through things like somatic release, which I've covered on this channel many times before. But ultimately, you just can't know. You can't clearly define if it's a projection or an accurate vision of reality because your internal perceptive system will never be truly clear. It, it just won't. And that is simultaneously frustrating, but also the true liberation of working in shadow territory. It's knowing that it's always going to be mysterious. And that knowing itself is also an unknowing process. We get to a level of complexity and paradox where we truly embrace uncertainty rather than clinging on to a juvenile, immature, childish way of experiencing ourselves and other people. We're just putting people into black and white categories or quickly labeling something which we don't understand, especially if there's a traumatic response which arises like a volcanic surge from within. Ultimately, Mandy, what do I suggest as a way of discerning on the day to day? Uh, is it a trauma? Is it a projection? Is it who they actually are? It's to gain more evidence over time and to also be very willing to acknowledge your own insecurities and your own inadequacies in the same way that all of us need to do this work and realize that a shadow projected is often a shadow yet to be integrated, but every shadow cannot be integrated and every projection cannot be withdrawn. It's not a happy little bow to wrap on the end of a video. It's genuine, actual, realistic adult thinking and adult behavior, and that's all we can do. Sorry, it's not more than that. That's just the truth, and I wouldn't want to pretend that I knew the answer because no one knows the answer, and there's hundreds of books in these, these bookshelves behind me that have tried to find the answer, and the answer can't be found because it's a mystery. That's it. Next episode in the series, question and answer, we're going to be talking about creative libido and about all the mysterious things about being creative. That's it.